So welcome to week seven of marketing and data analytics. And this week we're going to explore in the lecture, the marketing mix, and we're also going to explore it in the tutorial. So to start off with, we're going to put a bit of context in today's session on global marketing and the implications for marketing over a number of different territories. We're going to then consider what the marketing mix needs to look like. Now, this is part of the positioning of a, um, an organization to appeal to their target audience. And then as part of the marketing mix, we're going to consider marketing communications. Um, so that is the promotion of the marketing mix. So the organization that you've chosen may well be one that has a global strategy. So it operates in a number of different countries. And that's really challenging because the whole benefit of doing that is where you've got economies of scale. So economies of scale mean because you operate in volume, you can bring your prices down, you don't have to duplicate or amend things. So in theory, you can have the same advert in a number of different countries. However, there are cultural implications. Will that work for different territories? Will people feel that it isn't a good fit? Will people not see themselves in your communications? So we've got culturally, behaviors are very different. The context of usage of your product may be very different. There can also be different languages. So obviously, so one advert wouldn't be able to be translated because it would need a whole different script, different actors, a different setting in the background. But even the way it's delivered, even the way, for example, people drink tea is very different in different countries. And so, um, and the appeals can be quite different to so the motivations for using things. So for example, in the UK or America, you may talk, talk about time saving uh, for, um, uh, for busy mums, and that is a key benefit. Yet for some other countries, perhaps uh, in Saudi Arabia or another a territory where actually um, the role of the mother is very different, time saving could actually seem to be, be lazy and actually almost the opposite of a positive uh, benefit. So we need to be really understand the implications and the culture of where we're trying to target and, and adapt our marketing messages accordingly. So because digital has grown so much, this means it's much, much easier to expand our territories through the internet. But we've got to understand how people behave in different countries. We also need to understand the use of different languages as well, where that's necessary, where we can standardize. Because obviously, the more we can standardize, the more cost effective it is. And then finally, how, how payments are processed within these different um, countries and the, their use of online banking, their use of Apple Wallet, for example. So let's have a look at some of these in more depth. So in terms of culture, um, there are differences all through the world. And actually, so some of the bigger brands, some of the um, sort of brands that tend to be fairly standardized, the likes of Coca-Cola, the likes of McDonald's, the likes of Apple, their brand is so powerful that people almost buy into a Western culture. And that's part of what you buy into when you consume their brand. Um, now, that's helpful to the brand because it means they don't have to adapt too much. But let's have a think even about McDonald's. So their advertising in the UK or America tends to be very individualistic. It may include two individuals having a fight or playing, not having a fight, but playing basketball. I've seen an American advert and the winner who gets the most hoops um, gets the Big Mac. Now, that would never work for a culture that's more collective because they use McDonald's or consume McDonald's products together in a family setting and it isn't about being competitive. So there are very basic motivations that even the larger brands have to consider. Um, so another example of this where a company's tried to be quite standardized in their approach is Coca-Cola and actually some of their adverts. So their key messaging is quite similar across the world and it's about sharing and it's about happiness. And I noticed in some of their adverts, they've removed any a dialect, so no language, no words. There is quite a generic music in the background. So again, that can be adaptable. And the location in which the um, sort of the background location is one where um, that it isn't easily identifiable. So you can't tell if it's Italy or if it's the UK. 
Gaviston, the anti-acid reflux uh, medication, on the other hand, have a, the same formula of advert with a pair of twins, one in blue, one in pink, and um, one of them suffers, or they both suffer um, from gastric reflux, and one of them takes Gaviston. Their advertising, what they do is they use different, even physically, the actors look different for different countries. They do speak and their accents are different, their dialect is different. And also they do have cultural cues in the background so you can see in different countries where it is. This might be because Gaviston is more of a um, more of a sensitive product really and needs to be shown to know it, to that it understands its consumers. So if you have a think about this, so culture is a, a big consideration. Um, so from a digital perspective, what we need to do is understand if we're selling online, do people buy online? Do they use it just to inquire? Is there a trust in online? Um, what is allowed to be sold online? What are people allowed to access on the internet? Because that might change in different countries as well. So it might be that there is more of a focus offline in certain countries, more of a focus online in others. So that's an adapted strategy. Um, you also need to understand how many people have smartphones and tablets, what's the usage like, what's the internet connection like. Um, so this will all affect how things are designed and how clunky they are potentially to use. Also, we need to understand what people's lifestyles are like. Do people work a lot of shift? Do they work long hours? Do they commute in? So they spend a lot of time um, traveling on the train. I think um, pre-COVID, there was a, a trend that people were doing most of their Christmas shopping on their commute on their way into work if they were on trains. So this was something that was worth noting because actually you could get a peak volume at key commuter times for online shopping, in which case you then need to resource um, if more effectively a support line or support channels for people who are doing that online shopping at those times. And then also, what's our social media that's used? So we may be using Twitter in Europe and the USA, but in China, they've got a different um, type of uh, social media dialogue that's used um, or social media channel. So we really need to understand all this and engage with it because if we're customer focused, we're marketing focused. Now, the language used, that might sound really obvious, but in some ways we can get away sometimes without using a huge amount of language if we're able to display things with photographs. And another thing is, in some countries, people can't read, the li levels of literacy are a lot lower than in other countries as well. So you've got to be very careful in making any assumptions. Um, so we need to make sure when we're considering our um, how we're going to scale, which languages we're going to use in different countries. And, not, and some countries will also have multiple languages. Um, so that's yet another complication in this. Um, so when we're considering trading uh, globally, we our options could involve we just don't trade in a particular country. We might have a completely different brand in a different country. So for example of this is in the UK, we've got Galaxy Chocolates. However, when my Chinese students present about the chocolate, it's Dove in China. Now that presents a slight conflict because in the UK, Dove is a beauty brand for women and its values are all about inner beauty and real beauty. So it's got very, very different brand values. So that's quite an interesting contrast because Dove made something different branding wise to people in different countries. Um, so another example of so PepsiCo owns Walker's Crisps. OK, so part of their group. So it's Walker's in the UK. And in the UK, we have something called a culture of origin effect for walkers. The factory is in Leicester. Their choice of individual celebrity is Gary Lineker. Now, he was a former Leicester City football player and is very well known, very, very loyal to Leicester. So we've got the Leicester connection with the factory. We've got the Leicester based celebrity. And the whole idea of this is it presents a very sincere because he's seen as a family man. It's seen as a very sincere brand. However, people may not actually know that it's a global brand. And if we were go to the US, it's called Lay's. And if we would go to the US, the difference between the US and the UK, the different colours of packaging, which indicates different flavours, they're different in different countries. So if I were to go to America or if I were to go um, to Australia and pick up a blue bag and I think I'm getting cheese and onion, it will be a different flavour in, in different countries. Um, so there's a sort of code that isn't consistent or congruent across different countries. Also, in Australia, it's actually known as Smith's, the brand. 
So when you look at, and I think it's Poi, uh, it's in Poland, it has a different brand name. And their visual identity is fairly similar. So you could sort of say, I think they're part of the same family. So my expectations are that they're the same type of product. However, the formula, the taste, the flavors could be quite different. Um, so we might change our brand entirely, which I've just given you an example of. And the reason being that they do that is that, particularly with foods, people are very particular about their tastes and what their, their palates, what they've been brought up with. So it's really, really important to resonate as much as possible with local tastes. Um, so we need to make sure that we invest in those relationships. And if we're a global brand buying up a small or a national player, for example, um, Tata bought Jaguar Land Rover and they really wanted the name. There was no way they were going to buy Jaguar Land Rover, a very British brand with British heritage and values that has a, a certain perception in the mind, and then change it to Tata. Because changing the name to Tata would devalue everything that they bought in that intellectual property. So when we're looking at digital marketing, when you're looking at your organizations, it's really important to look at the language they're using, especially on internet, on um, social media, media medium, such as Twitter, where it's all language based with some images. And we need to make sure that the calls to action are appropriate for that country. So actually, in certain countries, we may, even for a big high value product, be able to sell now. In other countries, we may not. OK, because it might be about inquiring the next step. So it might be a slower process. So this relates to cultural, the cultural um, dimensions from Hofstede, which is like the individualism versus collectivism. And that's what I mentioned in um, the um, example of McDonald's. We've also got time orientation as well. So actually how fast or how slow people are in terms of their pace of movement. And actually in terms of calls to action, that will guide how quickly we can get people to respond. I mean, it's all based on assumptions and grouping people's behaviors together, but it gives a good indication as to the differences of behavior across different countries. So another consideration for our global brand, how are they going to accept payment online? Uh, or for their or offline indeed um, is it a cash society are there the right have you got the right sort of options available to people do people buy on debt so actually you need payment plans um, are they using paypal are they using apple wallet are they using their phones to buy things are gift cards um, important to them and the reason why what you've got to do is have a customer focus so when we're designing this whole sort of global strategy again we're coming back to do you remember um, the segmenting targeting and positioning which i keep referring to because it's so important if we understand the customer if we understand our target market and their behavior we can totally get the interaction correct with them so now we've thought about global, our global strategy, we're going to move on to the marketing mix and the elements that we need to get right to position what we do in our customers' minds. And there are four aspects to this. We've got the product, um, so what we're selling. We've got how much we're selling it for. So that's back to the marketing exchange in the first lecture. We've got the place, which is otherwise known as distribution. So how are we getting it to them? And when we're getting the promotion, which can also be seen as marketing communications, which we'll look at in more depth in this lecture. So a product could be physical or it could be a service proposition or more likely than not, it's a bit of both. So we've got um, maybe a fabulous product that is wrapped around with excellent level of service. So this would be something that Apple are trying to achieve. So we need to ensure it's something that consumers want and that people, there's an actual demand for it. And this goes back to the Boston matrix as well, where we're looking at, is it a, a cash cow? So has it got a high market share and it might be in a, a slow grow market, but it's worth doing. Is it a star? So it's in a growth market or is it a dog? So it's in a small market uh, a dying market with a dying market share so with our product we need to make sure that we are distributing it in the right way so how can we sell it um, so with and whether we can actually sell it online so if it's a car if people have already gone to showrooms and tried the car we may be a pure online retailer where people actually know what they want already and they just place the order with us even though it's a high ticket a high value item or 
Um, is it just a way to stimulate is uh, online with audiences? So do we create the opportunities and how do we show that we're different online as well? How do we continually update what we do? Can we create a sort of community co-creation of marketing, co-creation of the products? Walkers do this really well. So walkers have done campaigns called Do Us A Flavour. And by that, they get residents in the UK in different areas in the UK vote for their favourite crisps. And they even create new types of crisps and new recipes. And actually, this continues to innovate, but also shows a local focus, which is phenomenal for a global brand. Um, so we need to think about with digital consumers, are there things that we add extra or take away? Um, so do we change the product proposition for our digital compute um, consumers? Is it purely a download? In which case um, is the speed of access something they're prepared to pay for in the same way at the same price as they would do if it was a physical product? So in terms of the price and how much we're asking for, um, it, this is part of the marketing exchange. What are people willing to sacrifice or to give up in order to have access to what you're doing? Um, so one thing we can do is do sales promotions to get people to buy now. And that idea of a call to action. So actually it's time limited. Uh, we can also do things where we're trying to build loyalty through offering cashbacks. Um, and also we can do affiliations. Uh, so we can go onto different websites, but we give them a commission with every sale. So that actually isn't priced to the end consumer, but it's priced to the organisation. And remember with pricing, it's a psychological signal. So it's not necessarily logical. So if we pay more for something, we're likely to value it more because we've sacrificed more for it. So actually, this is why something we might buy at Poundland, we devalue in contrast to something that we buy in a more expensive retailer even if it's identical. So sometimes we're better off pricing things more expensively and we'll actually get more sales than we would do if we made them really inexpensive. So the place, this is location, 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 but actually it's distribution, distribution, distribution. How are we getting our products to our customers? Are we gonna have some pop-up shops? So we could have some little outlets that just come up ready for Christmas to distribute our products. Um, Nutella did this a few years ago. They did a campaign where they did personalised Nutella with labels for particular people. And they were doing it a bit similar to how Diet Coke had done it with the different names on the cans. And they had um, pop-up sales booths in different shopping centres over the festive period. And they paid, people paid an absolute premium price for the privilege of having their name or their, somebody's name if they were gift giving on a tub of Nutella. So if we get it right, we'll get a huge traction and we'll get a lot of footfall. Uh, we'll get the right people walking past if it's uh, an emerging area and if it's an area for hipsters, so young and fashionable people are starting to come to this area. And actually the rent isn't very much because it hadn't traditionally got a high footfall. That's fantastic. But we need to make sure the right people are coming into the area where we're selling. But actually that works just the same online. So how are people finding us? Are we found and are we getting the right level of traction? So we need to make sure from a digital perspective that people are actually finding where we are and what we're doing. If someone arrives there, can they easily navigate it and find the product that they want? And actually, do we have what they need in store or are we making things to order? And are we doing it purely through wholesalers so we don't even hold any stock? Um, so this is something to consider just in terms of the operations, but actually it contributes to the customer experience. So our promotion is what people like they, their initial, this sort of stereotype of marketing is that it's all about promotion. It's all about advertising and marketing is about selling. How actually, however, that's actually just one aspect of the marketing mix and it's one set of key decisions that need to be made, but it's not everything. So we need to be really careful that our promotion ties in with what our customer, our target customers um, would expect to see, but also what gets their attention. 
So what you need to think about is the relationship they've already got with your brand, your target customers, and what we need to do in terms of our our communication objectives. Um, So we need to think about the message that we're putting out there, the, the media choice that we're using. Are we doing things that's what's called above the line? So this might be mass market advertising, it could be billboards, um, and it could be uh, TV advertising. Um, so this is very much, we've got one cost, usually quite a high cost, although things like television advertising are reducing in price. And the reason being, people are watching adverts less. Um, and they are because they're fast forwarding through the adverts and there's more channels to choose from. So whereas um, a number of years ago, there would only be a couple of channels to choose from, no one could fast forward. Your TV advertising was a way of reaching the nation. Now that's absolutely not the case. Um, So if you did want to do, for example, TV advertising, if you want to get a huge level of exposure, you need to pick a live event that people are actually watching live and not skipping through. So it might be something like um, the finals of a talent show, uh, a football match, and that's where uh, organisations still charge a lot for advertising. Now, below the line advertising is where we actually tailor our communications to our target audiences much more. So we can do this through SEO. So we're looking at what people are searching for and then we're presenting ourselves in the right way. Even direct physical mail, there are brands in the UK such as not on the high street and they will create direct mailings to our through our letterboxes with our, not just our names on, but tailoring it and printing it with things that we, are of interest to us based on the data they hold about us. Um, Emails, again, can be tailored in a very similar way to based on our search history. So if we've looked at something on Amazon, we've chosen not to buy it, then we need to consider, um, do we want to, um, like what they'll do is they'll email us and say, you put something in, you were looking at a product, do you want to check out with it? So they're trying to close that sale based on the intelligence that they have and then the data that they have on us. And a really effective way of doing it is doing a bit of both. So actually, you've got above the line, so you're marketing wholesale, uh, scattergun if you like, but get raising awareness. And then below the line is actually the brand is talking directly to you and tailoring their communication. So we're now going to look at expanding further on this idea of marketing communications and promotion. And marketing communications are the dialogue that we're having with an organisation. They're not just about selling, they're about understanding the whole map of dialogue that we're having, this comprehensive plan. So this involves advertising, it involves um, getting direct responses, we've got strong calls to action, sales promotions are where we reduce the price. And public relations is more about profile building, but it's not in a heavy sales way. So we've got all these different disciplines that together create marketing communications. Media is where we're choosing different ways to have those dialogue different channels. So this could be TV, it could be radio, it could be billboard advertising, but we're paying for it. And in our our expectation is that if we do X, for example, advertise on a billboard, we'd expect to get 30 additional sales each day from that area or 30 or drive 30 additional people to the store every day from that area. So we set expectations through key performance indicators. And we can do this by understanding um, the data and the current situation, and then how we want that current situation to change with the additional media that we're choosing. So, sorry, in um, our marketing communication plan, What we're doing there is we're building on SOSTAC or MOST or APIC, if you like, and you'll see there's connections here between each of those. So we're looking at the first point is where are we at at the moment? So this sounds very similar, doesn't it, to our situation analysis in SOSTAC, to our audit in um, uh, APIC and to our uh, analysis in the MOUSTIC model. So we're trying to work out um, what our current situation is. So that will come from internal. So what's our mission? That feeds through to the objectives that we've got as an organisation and how marketing is going to help us achieve them. So the next thing that we need to do, if we were looking at one of our marketing frameworks, which I repeatedly suggest that you do use uh, as a way of critiquing marketing activities, we'd then look at the situation, uh, then look at their strategy. And that's uh, once we've, no, we'd, We'd set the objectives, sorry, we'd set the objectives first, 
which is what we're suggesting here. So through the marketing communications they're looking at, so for example, they might do um, through the marketing objectives, they want to double their sales in the period between April and May. So two months, April and May, they want to double their sales. And in a, if they're doing that, so we know um, what their current sales are, we will be able to uh, anticipate what additional profit that will build in. So we can set a budget then that's realistic that if we're going to do that, we can afford to spend X on it. Now our strategies, our Marcom strategies, again, involve understanding as they do with our marketing strategy, who are the options that we've got to go at in terms of how we're going to segment them and what's our target audience. So if we know that and we've got a clear picture of our target audiences, we can then select the right tactics. And the tactics are how we're going to brand this, what are our communication messages and what are the media that we're going to use to deliver on this. And then we implement our tactics. So we do certain campaigns, we see what the results are, we control and measure. So our next um, thing that we're going to consider is a framework that looks at how communications work. So in this, we're looking at um, a DRIP framework, which talks about the role of different marketing communications. So the first thing is to differentiate our brand. So on a competitor landscape, how are we different? So we may look at the perceptual map here to understand how we're different and to build on that with our um, consumers uh, and to reinforce it with our marketing communications. So this is all about positioning and it's through the marketing mix. We then want to reinforce our position as well. So reinforcing it means that people, we show that we've got consistency, remind and reassure them. So at Christmas time, Coca-Cola get out their adverts with their huge Coca-Cola truck because Coca-Cola stands for happiness. It stands for sharing. And let's not forget, it shares for nostalgia as well. So they need to reinforce that because it's embedded in our mind, but we need to make sure that it remains top of our mind. So at the Christmas period, um, we if we're going to buy some cola, even if the rest of the year we buy an own brand cola from a supermarket, because it's Christmas, we go for Coca-Cola. So Christmas means Coca-Cola. Inform. So this is really important if people don't truly understand what we're doing or they have certain perceptions about what we're doing and we need to change those perceptions. So McDonald's do a lot of advertising based on informing because there are negative perceptions with what McDonald's do and their brand positioning in terms of their health, um, this idea that they're linked to obesity. Um, so they do adverts based on their fresh ingredients. They do adverts based on local ingredients, working with local farmers so they're trying to build this local connection so rather than feeling like a, a detached global entity they actually work locally and they do things with the Ronald McDonald Foundation to help children and their families in hospitals and um, so again this is more about well-being and about a, a family brand they also do things like support local community fit uh, clubs um, so sort of sports clubs as well again trying to counteract their sort of uh, the obesity so trying to counteract this idea of being healthy healthy and they introduce products like fruit bags and um, carrot sticks they do a healthier range where actually they publish all their calorific values to try and ensure that people are aware of what they're eating but again to show that they are not trying to dupe people they're not trying to um, misrepresent themselves so mcdonald's are constantly having to inform they've done advertising campaigns before now about um the quality of their chicken nuggets because of the misconceptions of how they're being produced and they have people that are scientists talking about them and uh, parent scientists that are parents and talking about um, would they allow their children to have these chicken nuggets and then persuading this is where we're embedding our calls to action so what do we want people to do next do we want people to buy things do we want them to book things do we want them to inquire so let's have a look at some of these examples. So we've got some examples here in terms of differentiate. So Cravendale is quite a premium price milk. So it's more expensive than the average milk. And their adverts, are, they're a bit strange really, but they've got the cows on them. So they're associating with the source of the product and the cows want their milk back because it's been um, so well treated that they're sort of almost saying it's the cow's choice of milk because their milk is finely filtered. So that's an additional process and an additional cost and it makes it taste even better. 
So reinforcing, so McCain's um, do things like oven chips and actually um, they are very sort of trying to be quite sincere in terms of the nutritional contents, what goes into the products, the way that they're made. And I have a friend who works um, at McCain's and she said, the people who work there are so proud of the humble potato and what it does. So actually, people are really bought in internally and actually that's going to really help with their external communications. Inform or make aware. So we've got these ideas of the flood action week um, and there are action in the UK where when there's flood warnings, people are told what to do in a flood warning. Obviously, a more recent example is in the pandemic, there have been lots of slogans, reinforcement about how we should behave, whether it's making space, wearing face masks, whatever it is. But there always tend to be quite catchy slogans that are easily repeated in terms of building knowledge and then persuade seal it bang bang and the dirt is gone. So basically, it's that direct that if you use our product, these are the benefits. So use it. OK. So just in terms of actually seeing this in a pictorial way, um, Fairy has a problem, Fairy Liquid, in that it's so much more expensive than own brand products. And so what they do is they like to show the reason they're so expensive in comparison is because you only need half as much because of the quality that we have. So actually their advertising all tends to be around reinforcing their quality position against their competitors. Then another example we've got for reinforcing. So I mentioned that Coca-Cola like this position of sharing and happiness. And we'll see here, this is quite interesting because Coca-Cola isn't necessarily a brand that's associated with healthy living. And you've got there this sort of beautiful countryside and nature. And yet you've got this heavily branded carbonated sugary, in theory, sugary drink, um, although that's changing as well because the product has had to change through government, the, the government rules in terms of the level of sugar to um, and the implications of tax. So what they're trying to do is there they've got a picture of an individual, um, possibly male, but we can't even tell if it's male. We don't know what nationality it is. So culturally, do you remember I said about global branding and global marketing that we really want to keep this as generic as possible? This could be anywhere, but wherever it is, we open a Coke and we open happiness. So they're reinforcing this idea that Coca-Cola means happiness and it's a, a world sort of agreed phenomenon. Now, this advert for informing what makes them different so Dyson are quite innovative and are constantly launching new products and services. And they are really uh, an engineering led business with a difference uh, in terms of the product quality of what they do. I read when I found this advert that it had come under quite a lot of scrutiny, actually, in terms of um, not being entirely accurate. So advertisers have to be very, very careful in that their messages are actually accurate. So um, they've said they've, they show the product. So you see the size of it, what it's like. And then they talk about the product be benefits and then give the name for it as well. And then they actually give a claim there. So informing is about educating, actually, and showing what the benefits are of using a product or service. And then persuading, that's got to have real impact because we want people to act on this. So I've got an example here of cigarette smoking and actually what the implications are, because what they want to do is they actually say, we'll help you give up before you clog up completely. And this is the British Heart Foundation. So they're trying to say, act now. So actually, it could be in a commercial good and it could be buy now or it could be change your behaviour now. So when it comes to communication, we've got a number of different media that we can use. We can advertise and um, by advertising, we're paying and we've got total control over it um, and we can show and promote. And as long as we're operating it within the advertising standards of that country, and these vary and that's another global consideration. So in the UK, you can do comparative advertising. So in the UK, you can advertise as a supermarket against another supermarket. In Australia, you have to be very careful about that. Um, some countries won't allow you to use children in adverts, other ones will. So some will restrict when you can show certain adverts, especially if they are aimed at targeting children to try and target pester power. So we've got all these different sort of considerations for advertising. Um, personal selling, this is individuals, so they've got a sales force where they're actually getting people involved and it's a high value, generally quite a high value sell or a knowledge based sell where it's really helpful to get people who know it. 
um, and know about the projects and the goods and services to communicate that. Sales promotions, this are short term, either price drops, but there's some added value in there. So they're encouraging people to sell the product or service, um, to buy it, buy at now and you get so much free. So this could include product bundling. So actually if you buy something, you get this with it for free or at a reduced cost, or it could include uh, be price drops or it could be extended warranty. So there's all way, sorts of ways that aren't just about altering the price. They can be about increasing the perceived value and it can be at a very low cost for the business but it's an idea of it's stimulating a call to action public relations is softer than this it's about building relationships maybe through charitable goods or charitable relationships uh, about building the corporate image about for what they do and then direct marketing is about creating a direct connection with a particular consumer so it's targeted so it really shows that the organization understands their use and their behavior so just to compare these different uh, different types of channels uh, of media. So advertising tends not to be believed. We can control it quite heavily because we can say exactly how we want it to look, where it's going to appear, whether it's color, uh, what uh, the messaging that's on there. Because of that, if we're reaching a lot of people, if we're reaching using um, a message, um, that's very controlled, um, that then means it's at quite a high cost. But people don't believe it. They do not believe adverts. 80% of people do not believe advertising messages because they feel they're not credible. Um, so it helps in terms of informing and educating. So it helps to build a pipeline and it can also help in showing how we're different. A sales promotion, this is about changing the trade off in terms of the cost and the price to stimulate action. We can control that very highly. We can do it for a very short period of time. It can be medium cost depending on what we're giving up in terms of what we're giving away. Um, the credibility, people do tend to believe it more than advertising. So they do tend to, you know, they might have a little bit of what's the catch. Um, and actually, it's all about persuading. It's about creating a call to action. Public relations tends to be more expensive um, and it's uh, no, not more expensive. It's cheaper. Sorry. So it's at a lower cost, higher level of credibility, but we can't control it as much. People might not include our press releases. It's much gentler. It's about showing people that we're there, but it's not in a heavy sales way. So it can be an effective way to stimulate brand knowledge over a period of time. Direct marketing is where we're selling directly to people or marketing to them based on their needs and preferences. We have a huge level of control. It's cheaper than general advertising because we tend to know these people so we can build the communications directly. And the idea is to persuade them to do something with us or reinforce our brand messaging. And then personal selling is individuals who are highly knowledgeable generally, really good at engaging with people and getting them on board with the brand and to start experiencing it. So it can be very costly. It's very good at persuading. Um, it's quite good to potentially use for a very complex product. So maybe software sales or products like beauty products where you're spraying perfume on people and they're talking to them or doing makeup things. So something where there's a more uh, personal level of engagement. We've also got options when it comes to um, promotions and communications in terms of whether people are paying for it. So if an organisation buys it for Google AdWords, for etc., we are getting access to an audience, but in exchange, we're paying a premium price. But it really can be effective in terms of raising our profile. If we own it ourselves so that we could be a big retailer where we do a lot of in-store promotions and that is much less expensive. People already like the brand um, and we're already using what we've already got. So that's great, but not so good for getting new people in. And then earned media, this is on the public relations side where we actually put effort and graft into this, into this relationship. And because of this, it can be actually harder to control because it may be that people are saying negative things, but we're engaging in a dialogue. And so this is more uh, real time and it's seen as more sincere. So paid for, as I mentioned, could be something like Facebook, YouTube or Twitter. Um, it's a very well established way of building a pipeline. It's a really good way of getting an idea as to whether people are interested or not, because we can see how many people are reached. Potentially, we can see what their calls to action, how many people click on things so we can measure metrics depending on the channels we use. Um, so we can look at how it's worked in terms of being targeted. 
Owned media, um, we can again, we can look at the level of interaction with this and we can see as well um, how we compare to the competitors. We can ask for feedback in terms of the customer experience and we can see like sentiment analysis in terms of content analytics. So we can use this data to understand um, if we're achieving the objectives that we set out and what the techniques are in terms of embedding messages and how effective they are. Um, so owned and earned media, because we're able to um, measure things more, be, because we're able to have two-way engagement, it, then we're getting more information back from this in terms of data and we can get better and better at it. Um, so it means that we can perform better as an organisation marketing and advertising wise. We can give a better level of customer experience and we can personalise our content to individuals more on the channels that we're using. And we're going to see this more and more. Advertising will be specific to your needs. So we've got some examples here of uh, traditional forms of media, really. So broadcasts are our one to many. So we've got our TV or radio. We've got printed advertising, but actually a lot of print is now going online. So we've got more engagement on the online because we can measure more the metrics. Um, but the use of consumption is going to be different. The screens are smaller. People might not flick through the whole paper. The, the um, amount of time that, and attention they've got because they may be doing other things. We've got out of home, so when people are out and about, we can do different sort of stunts, if you like, different street furniture, but we create an impact there. Digital media, which this course has got quite a heavy focus on in terms of understanding engagement, understanding the data collection here. In store, this is our owned media. So we're actually got points of purchase. Do we want people to buy a bit more? The way that we package things, this whole sort of um, physical experience that we've got. And then there's all sorts of other ones. So cinema is seen as particularly effective because um, people up until lockdown have still been very engaged with the cinema experience. And the idea is when you go to the cinema you have to switch everything off your phone off if you turn up in time for the adverts beforehand they've got your whole attention so they do a lot of localized advertising here and it isn't that expensive for local garages to advertise while you're sitting before the film begins and we've got all sorts of different ideas here we've got product placement that we're seeing in james bond films uh, rolex watches aston martins but it's this idea of embedding associations and then other examples ambient media may include um a little um, uh, on on roundabouts that we have little sponsored by signs, but we're just this idea of wherever we go that uh, an organisation has connected itself with the experience we've got, and then there can be some stunts and more fun things as well. So when we're looking at messages, we've got different types of messages which are being conveyed. We have um, information messages, so these are rational ones. We've more emotive messages, and quite often a combination of both tends to be in place. For more commercial marketing, it tends to, in my experience, it's more emotional marketing with some informational messages. So there's some rational content, but it's generally emotive. User-generated content is fabulous on social media in particular, and you can use people's own feedback to market your brand, which is seen as far more authentic. You know, don't take our word for it, listen to our customers. And then branded content can be used in advertorials. So we're actually putting, demonstrating our knowledge out there um, in association to our area of expertise. And diffusion is about how much we're getting all these messages out there over a period of time so that people are engaging with them. So just to sum up in terms of the customer journey with advertising, we need to understand our target audience and where they've previously been at. So uh, in terms of how they feel about what we're doing and how their, their needs, their problems, their response to innovation and actually how they engage with other people. Then we need to, based on our target audience, so our characteristics of the decision making unit. So in other words, our understanding of our target audience, we understand how much money they've got, where they operate, what their personality is, how they engage with communications. We then design them to persuade them. So we look at giving ourselves an advantage in terms of innovating. We look at how we're compared against other goods and services. We need to simplify the process so that we're easy to engage with. Or maybe we make it more complex. So they're more invested in that engagement when we've got them, but they want it enough. And then we observe what happens. Then they're going to make a decision either to use what we do, continue using what we do or stop it. Or they may just reject us outright. 
And then we look at how we are implementing then our communication, our sort of ongoing communication. And we need to confirm with them. So actually that they've done the right thing working with us because actually there's something called dis dissonant cognitance, no, cognitive dissonance, sorry, cognitive dissonance. And this is where we conflict with what we bought and did we do the right thing. So we need to reduce the cognitive dissonance by continuing and confirming with them they did the right thing in buying us because they are one of the most innovative people our brand has won awards well done you for, for working with us so the whole thing with marketing communications is about bringing together with audience co-create and have a dialogue with them engaging them so our idea we need to differentiate reinforce inform and persuade our audiences to engage with us and we need to use our marketing mix so our price product place promotion to engage our audiences our target audiences and be congruent so in the seminar, we're going to consider more about the marketing mix and the data we'll use within the marketing mix, but also how we can convert that. So where the marketing mix has evolved to a relationship model instead. And then we've got our list of um, references at the end. So today we covered global marketing and just considering the complications that are involved in operating over a number of landscapes. We then considered the four P's and actually how they contribute to our target audience's experience. And we concluded by looking at how we formulate marketing messages and how we use different media to communicate them and also the customer journey that they go on. So there's the references and I look forward to seeing you in the seminars to discuss the marketing mix further.